in a busy clean yeah good morning dr patti think you are, you have to unmute good morning good morning. morning morning how are you how are you i'm good good to see you again and yeah same here yeah. and uh, today's topic is very interesting relevant to all of us yes i know uh, you know uh, in the era of technology we are relying more and more on investigation <laughs> technology replacing the touch <laughs> yes and uh, some of our teaching is also like that and at the same time patients expectations are you know okay. very much oriented towards investigation okay. and uh, Every day in OPT we come across. We won't order uh, ultrasound and all, but patients will go out and get it done on their own. No, they have also caught on to that mania about uh, you know scans and CT karalo, MRI karalo. Yes, kind of, mm -hmm. kind of situation. Anyway. Media is also responsible to some extent. then consumer protection act doctors are also scared what to do later on they will say why you didn't get all these things we want to save money our training is you know mission hospital oriented we want to save uh, patients money we want to give cost effective treatment Absolutely. but uh, whenever we have to face all these problems we feel like uh, yeah that's so very true that is the other respect of it i saw lovely pictures of uh, you i think flag hosting or something it came on the facebook yeah <laughs> this year it was better than last year you know last year we could not do anything ah, at least uh, some gathering was there and uh, we invited uh, industrialists mm. Uh, he is involved with a uh, lot of other industries they renovated our ward right. and now they are giving oxygen generator to us okay. compressor has already reached okay. and uh, that work will be done very good so and it's a good sign companies are now giving uh, you know it's like part of the csr they yeah see he is in charge of that Police Public Foundation. It was established in Ludhiana, 2017. Right. Few projects were done at that time, and now, after 2017, first time they did for CMC. Right. Right. And uh, this is uh, you have done good job, and we want to help you. And a uh, lot of industries were involved. It's a good sign. Yeah. Right. And. Uh, uh, We will involve them in other projects as well. That is there. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the grand rounds. Uh, rituals are all about transformation. We marry, for example, with great pomp and ceremony and expense to signal our departure from the life of solitude, loneliness, misery, and one of eternal bliss. <laughs> we signal transition of power with rituals we signal the passage of life with rituals rituals are terribly important they are all about transformation the ritual of one coming to another telling them things that they won't even tell to their close friends and that ritual exceeds importance and if we don't do that ritual of touching the patient examining the pulse you know putting that stethoscope listening to the heartbeat and bypassing we are losing an important we are bypassing an important opportunity to seal the physician and doctor relationship the topic for today's grand round is human touch the missing link in healthcare we have dr sunil chandi who is a former director of christian medical college vellore and currently he is the medical director of itc healthcare project he is a cardiologist by training he had gold medals in his mbbs days he is he got gold medal for his md 
and dm also so he's been gold medalist throughout his entire career a very you know uh, a good student so let's hear from him how this human touch he learned it imbibed it throughout his you know from his student days to a senior consultant and then you know practicing it in his day to day practice how he was doing it so we have dr sunil chandi uh, to present the um, grand rounds dr sunil please dr bhatti dr jairaj pandian dr ashish uh, faculty of uh, christian medical college ludhiana post graduates graduates medical students maybe a few who are tuning in from the periphery med mission hospitals i want to wish you all good morning and uh, thanking you for this uh, honor bestowed on me to give this uh, grand rounds you know historically medicine is a human science it has always been a human science from the days of the ancient uh, greek practice uh, medicine has been a science of essentially a human intervention it involved two human beings a giver and a sufferer or a carer and a taker a receiver but over the many centuries that have gone by especially in this century uh, maybe in the last 100 years uh, medicine has uh, taken a trajectory that actually deviates from that classical approach of uh, being by and of human being by and of human to a kind of uncharted journey uh, which is beginning to adopt a non human approach this may be part of technology or development but essentially today's grand rounds i'm going to focus on what it means to us as physicians as caregivers especially from the mission and vision that we have been taught to practice so my task with this morning is to actually think with you about these missing links now that are emerging in the new paradigms of healthcare and that missing link is called the human touch so what i'll do is uh, is to actually look uh, with you at touch and human touch touch as just a physical sensory signal the physical aspect of touch and somewhere along the line we will also cover the more important what we mean by the connotation of the word human touch or the phrase human touch which is not may not be about the physical touch but the meaning of when we say something we did it with the human touch or there was a human touch in what was done the metaphysical dimension of care that we are all trained to practice you know the hand uh, god's creation wonderful creation was the first sensory instrument it had these five functions it helped the physicians or the caregivers in arriving at a diagnosis and we have all been students of that philosophy of inspection palpation percussion auscultation which helps you to come to a fairly accurate diagnosis of the common problems that we have it is also uh, the instrument that is used for therapy whether it is you know massaging a part of the body or pressing a part of the body you know i don't want to go into details but we've used our hands in the skills that we have learned where we use something to get into an artery or a vein etc have all involved the human hand we also write with our hand right or left we write with our hand and we give out prescriptions uh when nothing is possible when we have reached the end of our medical capacity the patient has got extensive cancer or he is going to die we know we also use our hand for palliation to bring about that final sense of comfort 
which can be very soothing to the patient. So this five finger hand is an instrument of holistic care. In the days of old, um, the infirmary, as has been shown to you in this picture, actually represents uh, the place where nurses, mainly nurses and doctors would care for the patient with the essential skill of their hands. It was all about the nurse placing the hand, her hand on top of the patient's hand and asking them their well-being. Did they sleep the night before or how do they feel now? And do all the things that this picture represents in terms of bringing about uh, patient care. This has now changed into this. Of course, this is a very uh, sparkling, clean uh, picture of an intensive care, but you will have to add pictorially all the thousand gadgets that come in, <clears throat> the oxygen cylinders and the respirators and the nebulizers and the suction machine, etc. Just imagine this whole place filled with that. There's hardly any place for people to move when the patient and the full team of doctors are there. Uh, so there is a dramatic change with the introduction of intensive care suites, which are loaded with gadgets. And what do they do? They just vomit out uh, or they spit out tracings and data, which we then look at. Sometimes we may not even look at the patient because that's how our training is getting tweaked. And the decision-making tree has moved away. It is now becoming more on the numbers, the numerical values that come out on these little slips of paper or the tracings that come out to say, oh, it's got an arrhythmia or whatever it might be. And in many ICUs, uh, we know that as a practice, there is something called chart rounds. I have seen uh, this uh, where I train, where the chart rounds actually are much longer than the time that you spend with the patient in the ICU. The chart rounds is a sitting round where it is discussed uh, very well, very in great detail. And then it shortcuts the time that you actually spend with the patient. Now, whether this is good or bad, we do not know, but I'm just describing them to you. So therefore healthcare has come a long way and these uh, rapid developments have been very intense in the last uh, 25 years since technology and information technology has uh, become a reality. Uh, so healthcare is going undergoing a major transformation and uh, it has uh, uh, transformed in many ways. It has transformed in its form, which means the infrastructure. You can see how the facade and the interiors of a hospital has, uh, hospitals have changed. I saw a picture of a hospital just inaugurated last month in Jaipur which uh, if you're not told that it is a hospital, you would say that that is a seven star hotel, chandeliers and carpets and you know, fantastic Italian marble, so on and so forth. That has become the facade of a hospital. It has changed its function. Uh, it has become more therapeutic, which is good. And it's also become very organ specific or very specialty specific. Uh, cardiologist, neurologist, uh, ENT, is also now splitting into ear, nose, throat, uh, audio vestibular, whatever else. It's become very organ or disease specific. The format has changed and this is something that is naturally evolving. I think hospitals of the future, uh, especially with the COVID pandemic behind us, are evolving to become acute care hubs. It's no longer a co uh, composite facility where there's a section of acute care, which is 15, 20% of the total beds. The rest of them are all chronic care. That is set to change where the presentation, dramatic presentations of acute problems, be it fever or pandemic or accidents or uh, heart attacks or whatever, is now going to become a bigger chunk of what we call a hospital. So the format is changing. And of course, uh, not to forget that the entire financial, the fiscal policies of healthcare are also changing uh, as we speak. Now, I'm saying all this because this, this has an impact on the way we function as physicians, 
where we are supposed to be uh, preserving that sacrosanct space of a patient doctor relationship so these are the major changes that have come our way especially and these have all been in the last uh, 15 20 years uh, and i am mentioning this to highlight the reasons why the human touch is now becoming redundant it is moving from center to the periphery because healthcare is now being driven to be machine oriented it has moved away from a human skill to a machine skill by the thousands of gadgets that have come in and many gadgets have come in in the covid pandemic starting from the oximeter to you know the heart rate monitors and blood pressure gadgets so on and so forth it has moved from being clinical to investigation and as we were talking in the morning even patients are now getting biased to say what does the laboratory say can i i have fever can i i'll just go and do an rt pcr or whatever it might be the trust that they have on imaging ct scan kara lo or let me do a whole set of test uh, routine tests and, and it is just mind boggling to see what is now routine they do ferritin and uh, d dimer and so on and so forth just escalating the cost to the patient medicine is moving from real to virtual as we all know in the form of telemedicine this has become necessary in the current scenario of uh, post covid social distancing etc and all these things have had an impact of moving it from low cost to high cost care and as we know the future is on remote medicine and robotic medicine it is possible for the surgeon to sit completely touch free in the united states and perform a surgery or an angioplasty for a patient in ludhiana or the other way around uh, so remote the format of remote practice is now in vogue one other reason why medicine is moving from being essentially touch based to touchless has been this the number of stakeholders who are now vying for a piece of the pie Uh, they want the finger they want the finger their fingers in the healthcare pie it's not only hospitals but there is insurance there is device uh, manufacturers who are actually highlighting the advantages of being touchless there is a software industry which is working a magic to bring everything uh, to a virtual level there are equipment manufacturers and of course the pharmaceuticals Uh, these have all become serious players in the domain of healthcare uh, where they are now beginning to define the way healthcare is going to be if you look at 10 webinars today on the net at least 5 or 6 would be by total non health players financial express uh, cii fiki you know all kinds of organizations that doesn't have healthcare as its primary core uh, uh, domain but they are dabbling in healthcare because of obvious reasons the global headwinds are towards digital medicine uh, data data is the new oil as they say uh, nobody seems to be interested in the person from whom the data is coming it's all about data data will transform healthcare data will be used to Uh, to spell out policies and regulations uh, it's just mind boggling telemedicine online delivery of uh, both healthcare uh, through the telemedicine format and also retail medicine you know what may be called uberization where you will have now health aggregators who will bring you or take you to the resource of health and of course the new new trend that is that i call there's no such word but i want to call it pandemia the trends that are emerging from the scare or the fear that the pandemic has set in nobody wants to go anywhere or touch anything because of the scare that covid has induced in the general public these are the new sensory platforms it's not this hand anymore but everything will be brought to the physician and from the physician to the patient by this revolutionary technology called artificial intelligence internet of things blockchain 
machine learning and of course robotic now just imagine <laughs> a minute of what this is doing it is actually making the human doctor a little distanced from the patient because all these can now begin to rival and replace the physician that you trained for 15 years to become and even if you want to touch a patient this is the situation of most people who have been through the worst of covid uh, affectation uh, if you've gone to visit a relative or a friend who was in the ultimate covid care scenario you would find them like this wired and monitored from head to toe in fact many survivors had said that they don't even recall any doctor or nurse or nurse having touched them at all it was all wired for uh, the material that they needed from the patient and that is how the treatment has emerged some of them survived but many of them did not so we are in a touchless world uh, you know the post covid lifestyle is promoting this heavily and mind you this touchless format is a new platform for business as we have described how many gadgets and how many concepts are now going to come attractive to this patient uh, which is uh, about touchless etiquettes touchless homes i saw an ad about touchless homes uh, i can't imagine a home where you don't touch anybody or anyone but that's the way it is going and people are are sucked into this philosophy hook line and sinker because of the fear the pandemic has induced touchless offices where you don't have to do anything or touch anybody it is changing our entire lifestyle so is there a dilemma young people who are tech savvy might be muttering to say so what that's the way to go is there a dilemma no uh, it it is not a dilemma for those who are uh, uh, the new kids on the block who are or they are the new stakeholders of healthcare or new investors who are looking at health Uh, as a constituency for business and profit making because the number of software patches the number of uh, apps that will come out the number of gadgets that will come out are huge and there is a business so for them it is not a dilemma but it is a dilemma for you and me because we are trained in a certain way of life uh, as far as medicine is concerned it is certainly a dilemma for the patient ask a patient even though he may be tech savvy but who's been through a miserable experience uh, because at the end of the day he will complain that he was waiting to be listened to to be touched by a doctor or a nurse to be talked to to be cared for uh, that was what was missing in this fantastic treatment that was given if we ask the covid survivors they will tell us that the detached dehumanized experience that they had during covid or any prolonged illness haunts them you know uh, because that is human nature whether we are a, a small child or an elderly individual there is an inner craving for somebody to you know uh, take you into a warm embrace or to touch you uh, especially when you are going through a very miserable time so for hospitals like cmc velour sorry i didn't have a picture of ludhiana but you included uh, where we are constantly interfacing with the patient even in a high tech setup like this uh, there is a training which essentially emphasizes on touch whether it's taking a pulse or uh, looking at the clubbing of his fingers or doing a detailed examination there's a certain tenderness that is built into the doctor patient interface these are the facts despite all the technology has done everything the technology has done so far uh, some of them are are path breaking you know interventions and artificial intelligence is now being hyped to be something that is going to revolutionize medicine i am very guarded in my um, in my belief uh, in ai because uh, health for all we heard about health for all by 2000 when we were medical students in the late 70s and 80s 20 years and health for all was not realized 
it has been another 21 years since that deadline has passed us and it's still a pipe dream. Sustainable development goals is still a pipe dream and it has been totally set back by the pandemic and one has to rewrite the healthcare paradigms all over again. The touchless philosophy that we are forced to adopt is diminishing our clinical and human skills. I don't know about Ludhiana, but there is a diffidence for medical students to actually be at the bedside, despite coaxing them, cajoling them to spend as much time as possible just listening to the stories of the patient. Uh, there is a difference because there is a very attractive gadget, which uh, is this, uh, you know, where everything is available. You as a quick reference guide, any information you want and any information that you don't want is also available for you. Because of gadgetry and nobody talks about this, healthcare costs have risen. Today, healthcare is classified by the government of India as one of the reasons that pushes people into poverty. Just imagine the irony of it, healthcare cost. What you are doing to improve your status so that your prosperity will go up is actually the reason why one may be pushed into poverty. The healthcare that today is heavily mechanized, digitized, uh, and hijacked by the gadget industry uh, is certainly creating a flutter for those who have been trained and those who believe in the holistic human care that we have all been trained in. And let's accept the fact that pathology uh, of the world, but global pathology, you know, if you look at the, the illness, uh, everything combined, despite all technology has only become worse. And it has become acutely worse after pandemic with not just post COVID complications, but a whole host of uh, illnesses, including psychiatric illnesses have emerged. And the deficit of trust between the doctor and the patient has also worsened because nobody is talking. So, if you look at medicine as a science, the way it has evolved and everything, you know, evolves and grows, taking in the natural forces. And if you look at how medicine has evolved, it is actually about listening to the story. And one can't emphasize enough the value of a good history that should be taken. The surface approach or the, uh, you know, history inspection, uh, palpation, percussion, auscultation is something that uh, is time tested. It has uh, survived a century of more than a century of uh, training. And that is together a very powerful clinical tool. We've also used hands in external therapy or ointments, oils, vapors, and that is how medicine has evolved before it got into the stethoscope, which uh, was an extension of your arm. Uh, it did not obviate the need for touching the patient but it did help to listen to what is going on inside. Today's medical practice is very up-to-date, pun intended. Up-to-date software will give you everything that you want at the click of a button. It is less focused on clinical skills and more dependent on algorithms. The developers of algorithms often forget that algorithms work well for inanimate objects. The manufacture of this device or a car or an aeroplane, which is lifeless, static, uh, can be standardized. You cannot standardize a human body because God made each of us different from one another. And therefore, the algorithmic approach of medicine is something that we must take with many pinches of salt. It is today organ specific and specialized, what is called reductionist. We're forgetting to look at the man that is enclosing these various organs that the specialist is looking into. And of course, uh, the genomic uh, code, uh, which has been, which has uh, unraveled the inner workings of uh, human beings, which is being used admirably and very sensibly to discover new diseases and discover new forms of treatment. I don't know how many of you women in the audience would like in the future, a obstetrician who is a robo who will come and tell you everything about 
uh, you know, how to take care of the child and how to breastfeed and all that. It's hard to imagine, but that day is coming. Uh, how much of this will give you that sense of satisfaction and fulfillment is something that only time will describe. So, uh, so much for physical touch. And now uh, I want to just briefly allude to this picture, which you're all familiar with. There are several touch points of care in this whole story of the Good Samaritan. It was not just the physical bandaging of uh, the man's wound by the Samaritan, but there was a whole sequence of events which are all very sensitive touch points, taking him and putting him on the donkey. There was a contact involved. Taking him to the inn, there were several things that were involved there. Meeting the finances, these are all part of that expanded metaphysical aspect of touch which I emphasized about as I began this talk. So although the hand is, uh, you know, about seeing, touching, uh, hearing, smelling, and talking, you know, the entire spectrum of touch will involve all these things. When a patient enters your room, you see them, you talk to them, you may be even able to smell, you know, uh, naturally as he comes in, the smell on his clothes or the smell of his breath, whether it is laden with alcohol or with something else, with nicotine, and all that helps you to form a good clinical diagnosis. A I want you to listen to this. Uh, uh, a few man. months ago, a 40-year-old woman came to an emergency room in a hospital close to where I live, and she was brought in confused. Her blood pressure was an alarming 230 over 170. Within a few minutes, she went into cardiac collapse. She was resuscitated, stabilized, whisked over to a CAT scan suite right next to the emergency room because they were concerned about blood clots in the lung. And the CAT scan revealed no blood clots in the lung, but it showed bilateral, visible, palpable breast masses, breast tumors that had metastasized widely all over the body. And the real tragedy was, if you look through her records, she had been seen at four or five other healthcare institutions in the preceding two years, four or five opportunities to see the breast masses, touch the breast mass, intervene at a much earlier stage than when we saw her. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not an unusual story. Unfortunately, it happens all the time. I joke, but I only half joke, that if you come to one of our hospitals missing a limb, no one will believe you till they get a CAT scan, MRI, or orthopedic consult. I am not a Luddite. I teach at Stanford. I'm a physician practicing with cutting edge technology, but I'd like to make the case to you in the next 17 minutes that when we shortcut the physical exam, when we lean towards ordering tests instead of talking to and examining the patient, we not only overlook simple diagnoses that can be diagnosed at a treatable early stage, but we're losing much more than that. We're losing a ritual. We're losing a ritual that I believe is transformative, transcendent, and is at the heart of the patient-physician relationship. This may actually be heresy to say this at TED, but I'd like to introduce you to the most important innovation, I think, in medicine to come in the next 10 years, and that is the power of the human hand to touch. So that is uh, Dr. Abraham Verges, a very well-known uh, physician, author of two books, who practices at Stanford, uh, ethicist, and a great uh, orator, uh, just taken an excerpt of his talk on touch as a very powerful tool in clinical medicine. So it is about, uh, uh, you know, going back to what I call the art of medicine, which is being clinical. And we just saw an example of that. It is about being complete, not just staying put with just the symptom that the patient has, but looking at him or her as a whole person to find out what is the cause and what will be the effect of the treatment. It is about being communicative not enough to just take the history, but also communicate like you would in a casual conversation. It is about being competent, uh, 
therefore you have to know you cannot keep going back to up to date and say wait a minute let me just refer to this which is soon becoming the practice of uh, medical students and even uh, senior doctors to say that there's no need to remember all these things because it is available there it doesn't it is not part of being a caring physician and of course not to forget being compassionate is very important because touch begets empathy and empathy begets the readiness with which we are willing to touch one another listen to this i'd like to introduce you first to this person whose image you may or may not recognize. This is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Since we're in Edinburgh, I'm a big fan of Conan Doyle. You might not know that Conan Doyle went to medical school here in Edinburgh, and his character, Sherlock Holmes, was inspired by Sir Joseph Bell. Joseph Bell was an extraordinary teacher by all accounts. And Conan Doyle, writing about Bell, described the following exchange between Bell and his students. So picture Bell sitting in the outpatient department, students all around him, patients signing up in the emergency room and being registered and being brought in. And a woman comes in with a child and Conan Doyle describes the following exchange. The woman says, good morning. Bell says, what sort of crossing did you have on the ferry from Burnt Island? She says it was good. And he says, what did you do with the other child? She says, I left him with my sister at Leith. And he says, and did you take the shortcut down Inverlay Throw to get here to the infirmary? She says, I did. And he says, would you still be working at the linoleum factory? And she says, I am. And Bell then goes on to explain to the students. He says, you see, when she said good morning, I picked up her Fife accent. And the nearest ferry crossing from Fife is from Burnt Island. And so she must have taken the ferry over. You notice that the coat she's carrying is too small for the child who is with her, and therefore she started out the journey with two children, but dropped one off along the way. You notice the clay on the soles of her feet. Such red clay is not found within 100 miles of Edinburgh, except in the botanical gardens, and therefore she took a shortcut down Inverlay Throw to arrive here. And finally, she has a dermatitis on the fingers of her right hand, a dermatitis that is unique to the linoleum factory workers in Burnt Island. So uh, amazing uh, story, isn't it? You know, how just a glimpse of the patient as she entered in and just a keen sense of observation unraveled a whole story which was so accurate. Of course, this, is, uh, this may be fictional, but it actually represents the power of listening of seeing, of observing, and asking a few questions to unravel the mystery that every patient is when he or she walks into your chamber for the first time. None of these would have been discovered if she came in with an ultrasound scan or a CT scan into the chamber. I want to just share some true stories uh, from my own practice, just to highlight uh, the issue of being clinical and complete. Uh, this is uh, really happened in my department many years ago. A patient reported for a treadmill test, which means that he had gone to the doctor. The doctor had ordered a treadmill test and the patient presented. Lo and behold, uh, it was actually in preparation for a prostate surgery. Lo and behold, when he landed up at the treadmill room, this is what was found by the ECG technician, had an indwelling catheter and had one artificial leg. So very similar to the story that Dr. Abraham Vergis described. Nobody had examined him or taken the pains to just look at him as a whole person and wonder whether this one-legged man could ever be subjected to a treadmill. And whether that indwelling catheter, which was probably a prelude to the prostate surgery, would be a bother in terms of the treadmill that was proposed. Very powerful story of the need to see a patient in total, in full, ask a few questions and be complete before the next step is planned 
and the patient sent off. The second story is about an 85 year old man who is recovering from a surgery and has a post-op indwelling catheter. He, uh, I was involved with this case and I was called uh, rather late in the night that uh, there is mild blood per urethra which the intern had discovered. And uh, uh, the, so I, uh, before I knew, uh, very promptly, uh, the lady intern said, Sir, I have asked for a Euro consult. I have already asked for an ultrasound scan. And I think we will plan to do a cystoscopy tomorrow. I said, Why? It is because he's got blood per urethra. So she is in her mind following the algorithmic protocol without having even looked at the context in which this 85 year old had mild blood per urethra. It was just that he had yanked off his indwelling catheter in his post-op restlessness. The intern never took a history and never examined, but followed what is very modern and contemporary. There's nothing wrong in asking for a Euro consult, but was it needed? Uh, was the ultrasound necessary or rather wait and did not do that, instead followed an algorithmic protocol. There are several examples like this which highlights the need to spend a few minutes taking a history and examining before ordering the next layer, the next battery of tests, which might not just be not needed, but also raise the cost to the patient. It's about being competent. And this is a story which I've said several times when I was in the mission hospital, fresh as an intern taught that any hemoglobin less than 10, you cannot operate. A lady who with obstructed labor came in with a hemoglobin of three grams. And the senior lady doctor who's just an internist asked me, what would you do? And I said, refer this patient to the nearest hospital, which was about 150 kilometers away. To cut the long story short, uh, in the place where there was no blood support, no referral hospital close by, this lady doctor performed the surgery and it went off quite well. Uh, with a very healthy, hale and hearty uh, child and mother discharged at the end of uh, the hospital stay. The evidence told me don't operate, but experience said operate and experience won. It is about being competent. It is about being clinical. It is about putting the context into the scenario before we make clinical decisions. It's also about being communicative and touch is a, is a subsidiary uh, attribute to being communicative because when you touch somebody, you are communicating a tremendous amount non-verbally. Uh, it is the attitude of becoming a people's person. Medical students who are listening, do not hesitate to touch your patient in an acceptable way uh, when it is needed, when it will help the patient as well as you to arrive at a clinical diagnosis. Talking in the patient's language is very important because it resonates with the patient in his moment of anxiety. The body language that we have, you know, which includes the way we dress, our demeanor and our, our gestures are very important in being communicative. And that is also part of touching the patient in the larger sense of the word. Compassionate, uh, this is another story, again, happened in CMC Velour, and I'm sure this uh, happens in all hospitals. A farmer consumed uh, 10 ml of a pesticide and attempted suicide because of abject poverty, came to our hospital, was admitted in the ICU for about a month, treated, revived. He was a shadow of his own self, having lost weight miserable but when he was about to lay, leave he was given a bill of 1.7 lakhs after concession and this is what he said he said give me another vial of that same pesticide because it is for reasons of poverty that i wanted to end my life cmc allows us to write it off and it was given written off but it may not have been in another scenario so it's important that while expenses are there, genuine, there is a need to be compassionate at the end of the day. And I want to come back to this picture, the touch points that I vaguely mentioned. The touch points of care are the 
the the leaning of the sufferer with the caregiver the the whole layer of contact that the patient makes with the patient with the physician the warm embrace that the samaritan has over the person injured the touch between one hand and the other the touch that this donkey is offering as a means of transport from the place of the event to the place where care will be given there is also a touch involved touch point involved when the samaritan decides to walk a certain distance and take him to an inn uh, where the extended care would be given and there's also a touch point of finances in his pocket where he decides to sponsor and fund the rest of the care so there are several touch points which are today not a priority for health care givers doesn't matter where from you pawn or you sell or you do whatever this is the charge that we will put and you jolly will pay it it is not essentially part of a physician's job i want to end by just uh, quoting few uh, authorities who are in the mecca of medicine in harvard uh, different authors and these are all excerpts and comments from studies that they have done and this is what arthur kleinman says caregiving is a deeply interpersonal interpersonal relational practice the laying of hands empathetic witnessing listening to the illness narrative and providing a moral solidarity it embodies the moral face of caregiving that physicians are to provide the sufferer in order to intrinsically acknowledge their patient's personhood it captures everything that we are talking about and it captures everything that modern medicine is trying to disconnect from the element of touch atul gawande who is known for his writings have said this after several years of dabbling in emr that that interface between the patient and the doctor the screen the monitor physicians and nurses have become swamped with overcoming the learning curves for using these computer devices cutting down one on one time with their patients and i can watch for this how true it is when the monitor comes in between you you sometimes don't even look at the patient leave alone touch him or olivia drovin who revealed howard's this technology that will help us make better decisions uh, surely technology has to be adapted and adopted but whether it is delivering babies accompanying individuals through their dying days or announcing a diagnosis of leukemia the physician's greatest contribution resides in informing guiding and supporting patients human doctors human doctors still have a monopoly on what people most want human care i want to if there is time ashish i just want to show you this it's got nothing to do but it actually is very moving to yes, yes please carry on yeah तीन दिन से कह रही हूँ इस दाल से इसका कुछ नहीं होने वाला मेरी दाल के दो चम्मच पिलाने थे और मैं भी आपको तीन दिन से कह रही हूँ दादी कि बाहर का खाना अलाउड नहीं है ये घर का है चलो मुंह खोलो बचपन में जब क्रिकेट खेल के भूखा प्यासा आता था ना मेरी दाल की छे कटोरिया पी जाता था अच्छा हाँ आज दो चम्मच तो पिला लेते दादी दाल के दो चम्मच पिलाने दे ये बात तेरे पल्ले नहीं पड़ती 
आपके पल्ले पड़ती है बड़ी बड़ी मत कर बर्थडे है इसका इकट्ठे के लिए लाई ले और वो अब वो वो दादी दो चम्मच पिलाने थे सिर्फ दो चम्मच पिला दो thank you ashish that was uh, just a video which uh, emphasized many aspects of the touch that we talked about thank you uh, thank you very much for that excellent presentation and i can see so many comments there you know uh, they could see many new things uh, through the presentations which they never thought it exists like the samaritan story a different you know <laughs> new point and things like that i think uh, most importantly each each faculty who is there has to be a role model for the residents because they are silently imbibing most often what we see is the residents are busy presenting the rounds for the consultant and in that busyness they are missing you know that human touch the time spending time they want to just get that data which the consultant would be asking for the rounds and present that and finish with that you know going back and you know discussing the plan and you know that building that relationship it should start from early residency days so that you know they become you know more competent as a complete doctor that's just a comment the floor is open and you know we have many uh, senior faculty there in the audience would like you to give your comments and you know have your uh, questions yeah. or any points for dr sunil yeah ashish can i ask a question please yeah please go ahead good morning sir sir it was excellent presentation really mind boggling and especially the last video that you presented brought tears in my eyes i think over the span of few decades we have lost the touch of you rightly saying that i remember one of my uncles in 1985 when i joined as a first year 
who was brought to CMC and was examined. Everything was examined. He was diagnosed to have lymphoma, but unfortunately, um, while examining, there were lymph nodes in the cervical region, but axilla was not checked. So he said, no, no, doctors have not done a good job because they have not checked my axilla. But anyway, I think over the period of years, we have moved from X-ray to CD scan to MRI without even touching. And if I, I came across an article in BMJ where they stressed the need of the history taking and said that 80% to 85% of the diagnosis on the history and the examination and much less on the investigation. So the other side of the story is, I agree about everything, is sometimes when we get too compassionate with the patient and the relatives, do you ever come across, actually now we are seeing a lot of patients coming for mid, uh, financial discounts. Is it true or is it just my feeling that I come across that if you're getting too close, that they want a favor in return in the form of bill discounts? Because after all, everything has, to, even in CMC, we have to survive on all this. So that's just a small query that I would like your help on this. Can I answer that? Yes, sir, sir. Uh, you know, what my, what my experience is that every patient, even the patient in the private room, uh, deluxe room, would like a concession if possible. Y yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is human nature, that we want the best at the lowest cost. Uh, but actually, if you have reached out to the patient and there is a rapport that you have established, uh, they will often not... to ask you for a concession, okay? But even in that scenario, if they ask you for a concession, take heed of that because that may be very genuine. I'm talking about general ward patients. I'm not talking about private ward patients, okay? Because, you know, if you receive such good care, I mean, for us also, you know, if somebody is given a, uh, you go to a shop and if they've taken excellent customer service for you, you will find it difficult to say, thoda kam kar do because you have experienced that intangible touch, you know, across the counter. So they said, no, no, we've got enough. They have taken good care of us. We will not ask for concession. In fact, they might donate something and go. But there will be a handful who will still say, that's a very genuine request. And if it's possible, without incurring loss to the system, we say, okay, and you will have a very satisfied patient who will bring 10 more patients to you. It's about genuineness and sincerity and the attitude. Right. Thank you. It said that when technology is the master, the result is a disaster. <laughs> Depending too much on technology and losing that touch is another uh, major issue. Uh, Dr. William, I can see you. Uh, would you like to ask something? Uh, <sighs> It's an excellent presentation. As we were discussing in the beginning, we are more uh, dependent on uh, gadgets. And uh, I'm a pediatric surgeon and I always says, examine baby, newborn baby from head to toe. And we come across so many babies, normal anal orifice is absent and they have started feeding and patient present to us with peritonitis and all. Just simple examination will uh, prevent so many issues. Yeah. Other aspect of it is if we take listen to patient, actually patient is telling us the diagnosis. If we listen carefully, we don't have to uh, worry. We have to just listen. Very Third true. thing is we might have noticed uh, private practitioners or doctors practicing in a rural area, you know, in periphery, we have observed patients are listening to their treating physician RMPs yeah. very much. They follow their instruction. Yes, yes. What is the reason behind that? Interaction with the patient. They listen to them carefully. They are part of their family. We used to call it family physician. And uh, earlier doctor used to be part of the family. For every problem, they used to consult doctors. So th that shows their interaction time spent with the patient. Yeah. And even now it is existing. When they come to us, uh, I have to convince uh, parents. So they give their baby for surgery. It, as you had mentioned in your presentation, communication, if you are not good in that, 
they will run away they will go to some other surgeon so it's very important spending time with the patient it builds relationship and same patient will bring more patients so uh, i am very happy you have presented on that topic which normally all of us ignore and as uh, more and more we are into uh, investigations and reports and all those gadgets and uh, following the knowledge not wisdom we are losing that touch and i am sure today's uh, discussion talk will encourage uh, uh, many of us to you know use that uh, touch technique which is very important thanks for joining us and presenting the excellent topic thank you i think i can there are two more questions and i can see dr pamela also raising the hand the first is from dr priti paul she is a professor of pathology she says how can we model touch in covid areas where doctors and nurses look like plastic trees wearing ppe <laughs> yeah well i think uh, the covid uh, scenario is an aberration of the normal it is hopefully will not last and very soon we'll all go back to being normal human beings without all these uh, you know ppe etc uh, but you know uh, let me say this that even with a glove on Uh, and even with the patient who is covered if you just put your hand over your covered hand over the covered hand of a patient it has value uh, what he is sensing is that yeah there is somebody who is placing a hand on me and that is a surrogate marker of concern compassion care inquiry that is enough and when times become normal again we should get back with a lot of gusto to reestablish that skill that may have been lost over the last 18 months that diffidence to hold somebody you know nowadays we do shake hands like this it's become the style you know the fists uh, hand, fist shake you touch the fist like this you don't shake it's so sad uh, but that's the way it is recommended we'll have to do that but we must all make our effort especially in this uh, service of health care it is so important to est- establish that skin to skin or you know hand to hand contact in our delivery of care yeah uh, just two more questions one is uh, dr susan john she wants to know how do we uh, do this touch thing and spend more time when the patient load is very high uh, a patient <laughs> that's an admin question Uh, you know the administrators would want as many patients seen um, you know because of various reasons you know running the institution but that does not obviate the need for it doesn't it is not time bound you know for example if somebody is coming into your opd uh, the touch is starts from the time that you smile at the patient when he or she walks in uh, ask them to sit look at them into the eyes instead of looking at the monitor which is what we are often stuck ha bhai bolo kya hua kya nahi we are not even looking we are busy in our uh, requirement of documentation and data there's a there's a deviation on emphasis that you know everything has to be captured it is not important it is important from uh, documentation point of view but in that uh, you know to even if you say say 2 minutes or i look at you i just place my hand on you examine you that is more than enough so i think it is possible uh, uh, i used to see about 60 80 patients a day uh, of course they were all worked up by juniors but uh, my emphasis was not on reading the whole history because that would be known anyway it is already there they, we can read it after the patient leaves but just to ask him a few questions that the junior doctor may not have asked him about his family and you know just say don't worry we'll take care of you okay and just put a hand on him give him a shake hand okay give him an embrace if possible you know in a proper way i'm not uh, generalizing it and uh, they will they will palpate something different in the caregiving system that you have demonstrated and they'll come back to you over and over again but so that is what they want believe me you know and they often come with a, a full file of scans from done from 10 other institutions so they've come to you because they're asking for something different and this is our forte this is our usp 
which we have learned from our faith and from our system of training. Yeah, Dr. Pa uh, Pamela, can you please ask your question? I can say, see you raising your hand. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chandi, for this excellent presentation. And it was really nice. And I just wanted to say that, you know, I practice palliative care. So all those five C's which you mentioned, that also um, comes into play along with empathy. So that was very nice to hear this being spoken for all of us. And if, with your permission, if I can just uh, uh, answer Dr. Preeti's question. Yeah, like, sure, One sure, more thing in the COVID ward, then, yeah, thank you, sir. One more thing in the COVID ward when you're clad with PPAs is, as you said, rightly said, the touch and then the eye contact. And if we could, we could put our names on outside the PPE, that makes it like a human being, like sort of not like something in white. So that really helps patients. And this is one of the uh, aspects which was uh, discussed very widely in the literature that in the COVID ward with PPE clad, you know, it, there's no human touch or the feeling of a human being looking after you. So the eye contact and your compassion can very well flow through the eyes. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the excellent. Sir. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sunil. Uh, we are run out of time. Yes. And uh, accepting our invitation and preparing uh, all the slides just you know meant for our uh, kind of audience and you know answering all the questions thank, thank you so much thank you dr Bhatti. thank you dr jairaj i haven't seen him but i'm sure he's there somewhere thank yeah. you thanks next sir. week next week we have uh, dr shifali baidwal she is a cornea corneal transplantation surgeon uh, she is from arvind hospital and she would be talking about corneal transplantation uh, and eye donation in times of covid 19 thank you everybody and have a great weekend thank you, you.